At, on a day like today, just 40 years ago, the Kellogg Institute was getting ready to celebrate its first year of existence. It's hard to believe, right? But it was an, a very exciting moment because at that time, they were getting ready to receive the first cohort of visiting fellows. Um, and among they, they, I think they, they made a good selection. They were very excited about it. In that first cohort, there was this very young, promising guy called Scott Mainwaring <laughs> that, that showed some promise. <laughs> On a day like today, 20 years ago, Holly Rivers started the International Scholars Program, which has served as a model for how to engage undergraduate students in research on our core themes of democracy and human development. And it continues to be a model of how to engage students, undergraduate students in research. Um, many things have happened over the past 40 years, right? And tomorrow, I think you will have an opportunity to see, and today in our conversation, you will have an opportunity to see how complex, how rich, how, di how, how diverse the Kellogg Institute has become, um, how, how complex our intellectual conversation is and how rich it is. Um, and, and I am sure that somewhere the founders of the Institute Father Hesburgh, Father Ernie Bartel, the great Guillermo Donnell, they are very proud of the work of what we have achieved over the, over the past 40 years. Right? They are proud of the intellectual contributions that our faculty and our students, graduate and undergraduate, have made. They are proud of the work that our visiting fellows and our former visiting fellows have made. Um, they are proud of the work that our former directors, not only Guillermo Donnell, but also Scott, Paolo, Ted, Franagopian, all the work that they did on behalf of the Institute. They are proud of the consistent support that our advisory board has given to the Institute. And they are certainly proud of the enormous work that our staff has done over 40 years to make all of this possible. So this celebration is a celebration of all of you. Welcome. I wanna join Anibal in welcoming all of you to this terrific celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Kellogg Institute. 40 years is a long time in the life of the, is, I'm sorry, 40 years is not a long time. <laughs> in the life of a university. This is quite a common, I realize, coming from a dean of a school that's only eight years old. But the Kellogg Institute has packed generations of students, world-class faculty, staff, and visiting fellows, international conferences, influential publications, reports, and working papers, and a series of distinguished directors into these four decades. Pausing at 40 to look back and take stock allows us to discern an arc to the work that might not have been anticipated so clearly by the founders whom Anibal just invoked. A trajectory that in hindsight, we can say led us to this very moment. For this moment is particularly propitious and pivotal as we finalize the details of a new strategic framework that will guide Notre Dame for the next decade, and it is hoped, propel the university finally and inarguably into the ranks of the world's very best universities. The Keogh School, I feel confident to report, will be a significant, even defining contributor to the coming decade of achievement. My confidence in making this claim is based in no small part on the fact that this intense 40-year period has positioned the Kellogg Institute to play a decisive role in establishing Notre Dame as the leading authority on the comparative study of democracy worldwide. At a moment when democratic practices and institutions are in peril, not only in Central and South America, but in South Asia, not only in Eastern Europe and in Africa, but in the United States. 
the community of scholars, practitioners, educators, and alumni, which Kellogg has created and nurtured, and the worldwide partnerships it sustains, have positioned the Institute to play a central role in one of only a handful of top priority research clusters the that the university will identify as signature areas of excellence for the coming decade. That signature area is known simply around campus now as the Democracy Initiative. It is a major stop on Provost McGreevy's tour of the dawning horizon at the university. With our colleagues in the College of Arts and Letters, especially in the Department of Political Science, Kellogg will convene the world's very best thinkers, political leaders, and policymakers, which you've been doing for 40 years already, but we'll do this in an even more intense way to analyze the challenges to and opportunities for democratic institutions and practices worldwide. And Kellogg will bring to the table a distinctive strength, namely expertise in the social, economic, and cultural context in which democracy is flourishing or floundering, not least the situation of the poor and marginalized the vulnerable for whom the terms rights or development, much less integral human development, might seem a hollow, even cynical promise. Democracy, Kellogg knows, cannot be understood in a development vacuum. The Kellogg Institute is already, of course, an established expert in these dynamics in Latin America, and is growing strength in the study and understanding of democracy and development in Africa. With other international units in the Keogh School, including in, uh, instructive comparisons, will be made to Asia and to Europe. In short, Notre Dame and the world needs and is fortunate to have the benefit of four decades of Kellogg experience and growth, of learning every year more what it is, what it has to offer, and what it is called to be. So my congratulations to all of you here assembled, everyone here, and those who will join us tomorrow. Uh, Kellogg will and should celebrate its many laurels this weekend and brace itself for the even more astonishing achievements to come. Far be it for me to infringe upon your opening panel. But may I answer your question now? Is Kellogg still relevant now more than ever? Thank you. And, and now let me thank you, Scott, for the wonderful words. Um, we really appreciate them. Um, and let, now let me introduce the person who needs no introduction, Sharon Sirling. Um, I'm sure all of you know Sharon. Sharon was the managing director of the Kellogg Institute for many years. She arrived to Notre Dame in 1999, and she served as the managing director of the Kellogg Institute until 2020, when she, as she retired to do more fun things, <laughs> see if that's even possible, she, um, she was awarded the President's Award at the university for her contributions to Notre Dame. Sharon, thank you. Thank you, Aniva. Let me add my welcome that we've already heard from Anival and, and Dean Appleby, but I want to say how great it is to see so many familiar faces. Um, some I've seen recently, others it's been a long time, so it's great to see you all here. Um, we have a, a large panel and a little bit of time, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time just chatting here. I'm going to give brief introductions of who we have here, most of whom also need no introduction, but then I'm gonna ask them a question that's going to hopefully give more of an introduction to their work. We have Ted Beatty, professor of history and former interim director of the Kellogg Institute, Paolo Carrazza, professor of law, former director of the Kellogg Institute, Tracy kajuski Correa, the Leo E. and Patty Ruth Lindbeck Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences and Acting Director of the Pulte Institute for Global Development, Scott Mainwaring, the Eugene P. and Helen Con Conley Professor of Political Science and former Director of the Kellogg Institute, 
Anival, who introduced himself already, current director of the Kellogg Institute, and Rachel Sweet, who's an assistant professor of politics and global affairs here in the Keough School. And so without further ado, I'm going to open with a question and um, we can do this in any order, but maybe just uh, start in alphabetical order from the other end of the table. Ted, that means I'm putting you on the spot first. Um, I, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to tell us briefly how you first became engaged with the Kellogg Institute, how your own research as it relates to Kellogg themes has evolved since then, and where you see your research interests moving in the future, in the coming decade. Ted? Thank you, Sharon. Is this on? Folks hear me? Good. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Anibal. It's a, it's a pleasure to be up here. It's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to have been uh, associated with the Kellogg Institute for the last 23 years. 24 years ago, I got a phone call late one night from somebody many of you may remember, Chris Wellna, who was the executive director of the Kellogg Institute for about 10 years from the late 90s to the late aughts, um, and saying that there was a job opening here and that Kellogg was involved. Uh, Scott was chairing a, a search committee. I think code, I never really understood the landscape history department was a partner in this. And uh, there was a position open that I might be interested in. And I said, where's Notre Dame? Uh, I did not <laughs> I did not know much about Notre Dame other than, yes. Um, I knew about the Kellogg Institute, however. Uh, I had heard about the Kellogg Institute. I, I read something about its visiting fellows program as graduate students with an interest in Latin America and, and related issues um, know about very widely across the country. Um, and... Uh, I ended up applying for the job. I ended up, um, I think, being number two in that search process, but number one did not work out. And um, <laughs> so somewhere towards the end of June, I got a phone call that there was a job offer on the table and Scott convinced the key decision maker in my family that um, this was a viable place to live and work. And so 23 years ago, I came here um, and it's it's really and so my affiliation with Kellogg goes back to that. My appointment is in the history department. My affiliation with Kellogg goes back to the very beginning of my time here, and um, uh, and I've been here in the building almost ever since. Um, my work is really on the history of development, so it falls in one sense. I'm a historian. I'm a quali traditional qualitative historian in many ways, um, but I work on the history of development as something of an economic historian. Uh, and so I, I, I feel very much at home in the in the atmosphere here, um, and I, you know, having feet on both in the history department and here, I feel very much, um, yeah, at home in the Kellogg. And I'm grateful that I'm so grateful for the institute for everything it's done for me, but also to have been a, been able to be part of the program building over the last. Uh, much of the last 20 years here at the school. My own work is is um, started on the economic history, uh, uh, policy history, political and economic history in Mexico, looking at industrial policy in late 19th century Mexico, and then a project on patterns of technological change and technological development in 19th into 20th century Mexico. And most recently, a more global history topic, uh, looking at uh, technology, but particularly engineering, sort of starting with the observation that we live in a wholly engineered world and trying to understand better the global nature of the origins of, of um, the engineering profession in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And, and my actually the partnership, the research partnership I'm involved in there came, also came out of the Kellogg Institute, came out of a visiting um, uh, somebody who had a pre-doc here, a Fulbright fellowship, and then a postdoc here. And so again, it was the, the, the intellectual community, collaborative nature and spirit and, and the ability to convene people from across the world and across disciplines that made um, this project possible for me. Um, so it's been a tremendously exciting place to work. Um, and I, more than anything, I'm grateful to the Institute for Scott Mainring, who made that initial appointment possible, but to so many other people here over the years. Thanks, Ted. Paolo? Um, uh, great. Well, it's wonderful to be back here and, and be with everybody and be in this room. So um, it just really makes me great 
gives me great joy. Um, so I'll start, given what Ted said, with uh, an observation which may turn out to be sort of a theme for us, and that is Scott Mainwaring is central to just about everything <laughs> in this story. As Anibal pointed out, he was part of the first cohort, and Ted talked about how he recruited him. Well, 28 years ago, Ted, I was in, I was practicing law in Washington, D.C. when I get a call from a guy named Scott Mainwaring, who happened to be <laughs> on research leave at the Wilson Institute, I think, at the Wilson Center at the time, um, trying to persuade me to accept an offer that was on the table from the University of Notre Dame. And um, uh, Scott wasn't the only reason that I, we accepted it, but he was very persuasive in his giving me reasons to come as well. And he knew already at the time that the main thing that I was planning to be working on and was working on in the early years, in particular of my academic career, would be the question of human rights in Latin America. And, uh, and that immediately uh, gave me reason and good reason to be involved and connected to the Kellogg Institute and all of its uh, wonderful and extensive intellectual community and, and the font of knowledge. And it really allowed me to make my work when I came here much more um, interdisciplinary than it ever would have been otherwise. Uh, just to give you one example, because I could go on a long time. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to do something on sort of the history of human rights in Latin America as well. I'm not a historian, uh, but Sabina McCormick was here and boy, she was a historian <laughs> um, who crossed many disciplinary boundaries and was capable of having conversations with everyone and uh, about them and really embodied that, that, uh, that virtue of the Institute as a whole and really advanced my work. Uh, the more that I was involved, but in particular, once I became director, the, the work evolved into areas um, of uh, not just human rights as such, but the, you know, more thickly, the relationship between human rights and democratic transitions, uh, accountability for the past, uh, the problems of uh, emerging but endemically weak uh, democracies and how they protect human rights and relate to international institutions. And then from there into the development space as well. I, a lot of the work in human rights I'd done was focused on dignity. And, um, and when we started working on the development in the development area within the context of the Institute, that expanded greatly the question and uh, the, 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 the difficulty of the question and the interest of the question. And what does uh, sort of human dignity have to do with, with all of this as a core priority. Um, those are all just on the level of subject matter. I'll say very quickly, the research has evolved also in terms of form. Uh, the more that I was involved in the Kellogg Institute, the more that my research has become collaborative. I've done more work as a co-author, more work in teams of people, which uh, for a legal scholar is relatively unusual. Uh, so we, we tend to be very solitary and um, lonesome um, because nobody likes us. <laughs> and uh, um, and finally, it's changed in terms of the outputs as well, uh, especially in the final years because yeah. of the eight years since the advent of the Keogh School uh, that uh, that the dean was mentioning. Um, the work, uh, my work, became more deliberately uh, engaged with the question of how do we make it relevant to and interesting for and helpful for people who are in the worlds of practice and policy as well. How do we bridge that gap and translate the ideas into these other more functional environments? Um, now, since um, uh, in, for the last year, really, and since the end of my tenure as director, my work has started to shift a lot more towards questions related to technology and democracy, in particular, the digital information space. Um, speech, disinformation, its relation to elections, to the incitement of violence and conflict, um, and social polarization, and, and how that relates to, uh, you know, dignity and human rights and, and the common good, so. Thanks, Paolo. Tracy. So yeah, I, I don't think you hired me in any capacity. But you, I don't remember. you invited me to be a fellow. So my, my story will take an abrupt turn. Um, but I think there's already a you know a theme emerging. So um I'm an engineer for those who don't know, so a little bit of a unicorn in, in Kellogg and then eventually the Keo School. I work in the space of disaster risk reduction and disaster response. So I am in the grim moments for most communities, and I get to see how our development decisions and choices create vulnerability, and unfortunately, not often resilience, but rather vulnerability, and how those one events can set back decades of development, possibly forever. So in that space that I work in, I came as an engineer and Kellogg was a bright light on the horizon for me. 
most notably because I had been trained exclusively to think about the physics of that problem and not appreciating that while those physics and that collapsing building took a life, there were many reasons well beyond the physics of why that came to be and why we found ourselves in that moment as a society. So I was attracted and eventually found honestly a home where I could holistically look at that problem for the first time, have the permission, the space, and the partners to do that. And that's what ultimately brought me here um, shortly after the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, which is when I really started to grapple with these questions that my technical expertise could only get me so far. And it led me to commit what colleagues told me was career suicide in that I worked on some of the most exotic tallest buildings on the planet. I built things for very wealthy people um, because a lot of the research drove you toward serving those, um, those aims, unfortunately. And I literally had uh, just a crisis of conscience coming back from Dubai, working on the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building in the world, and figuring out how we would go to the greatest heights. And I was flying to Port-au-Prince straight off of that. And I thought with $1.5 billion that I'm spending on this building, in the middle of a desert, what could I do in Haiti? And that crisis of conscience really shifted my life. I committed suicide. It was the best rebirth of my life. So in that respect, Kella gave me my second life, hired me, if you will, became the platform upon which I eventually joined the Keo School and found life. And I guess what I would say for me is the biggest takeaway that I have already heard in the early comments, I'm sure gonna hear as we move down the line, is what how beautiful a world we live in when you build and you form a community around themes or problems rather than disciplines. And for me, that was what just lit me up about this place and gave me the sense of home that I was struggling to find so hard in a cold engineering world, very lonely and solitary, as you said as well, right? That I said, imagine a world where instead of you thinking, what discipline am I, what problem do I want to work on? And thereby, what other partners from other disciplinary views could come around that and work on that with me? And with Kellogg's generous support and encouragement, I was given the space to start to see how everything beyond engineering shaped what I was seeing as the consequence of you know, poor development, if you will, poor development decisions. So how did it change my life? I mean, it changed everything about my life. I would not be the woman I am today without this institute. And I owe it a great debt of gratitude for giving me that second birth and giving me a chance to push on this idea of not just integral human development, but what is integral human disaster response, because that's a moment where we shove, you know, direct needs and, and, and pushing aid in people's faces as fast as we can, and dignity is often lost in that, and decisions are made that actually don't perpetuate good development, but actually even reverse and create more aid dependence. So in a disaster response space where there's so much urgency, it's a place where an integral human approach is actually needed more than ever, that holistic approach is needed more than ever, and this institute gave me the tools, the partnerships, and the license to look at that problem holistically for the first time in my life and truly changed my life. So all my work has changed as a result of this place and the many good people in it. Um, and as a result, I think where I see things going now is not just a space where all the disciplines come around, but now hopefully one day all the institutes come around, the whole campus comes around these important questions. As Scott said, with a new strategic framework on the horizon, I think the day is here where it's not just about disciplines and even schools, but a whole campus approach to the issues that we care so deeply about, democracy and development being at the heart of those. And so I'm honored to know that I was a part of the journey and hopefully a part of the army that carries this work forward. And I thank you for Second Life. Thank you, Tracy. Now we'll move to Gran Jefe Scott. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, <laughs> How did I first become engaged with Kellogg? I was invited to come as a visiting fellow in 1983 to 84. I thought, yeah. Actually, I was invited to come for two years. I thought, yeah, that's a fantastic way to start a career. Little did I know that it's also a fantastic way to continue a career. <laughs> um, that has been just a, a great life gift for me. Um, how has my research evolved? It's so long ago that I can barely remember. But, um, when I came here, I had a dissertation on the Catholic Church and politics in Brazil. That became my first book. Um, but this space has always been one of great interaction, collaboration, amazing colleagues. And I fed off this and, uh, and produced a lot of work. Most of my work has been on democratization and party systems 
and some spinoffs related to those two main themes. Um, and finally, Sharon asked us to say something about current work that we're excited about that relates to Kellogg. Well, that's all of my current work. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna mention quickly six things. Um, uh, and you'll sense also the, you know, the, the way that being at Kellogg has influenced my career. Um, I finished a book last year, it was an edited book on democracy in hard places. Um, it's about why democracy sometimes endures for a long time under very inauspicious conditions. Um, I had a lot of great collaborators on that project. A uh, second already published project is with the most important collaborator of my career, Anibal, um, who came here in from uh, Buenos Aires, I think it was 1994. Um, and I immediately saw, oh, this guy is great. And I'm gonna do some work with him. So we published a piece in the Journal of Democracy about democratic trends and stagnations and erosions in Latin America really reflecting on the last 20 years of dynamics. And Brazilians saw it and decided to publish it in the Brazilian Journal of Democracy. And some a Mexican saw it and asked if we would publish a journal in Mexico with a bit more reflection on Mexico. So that, that was a fun project too. I have a book with our in progress with our graduate student, uh, Benjamin Garcia Olgado. It's a book on why democracy broke down in Argentina in 1976, and then has survived since 1983. And the thing that's kind of interesting about that, if you take the five deepest drops, economic declines, the deepest depressions in Latin America over the last 45 years, Argentina has three of them. It's the only country in the world where democracy has survived with three declines of per capita GDP above 15% each time. Yeah. Um, and so a fourth project that I'm really excited about is something with two people who are in the audience, two former students, great students, great people, Carlos Herbasoni and Sandra Botero, and also my colleague in political science, Luis Schomerini. It's our first, I think, I think that this is correct. I think it's the first attempt to systematically survey members of a Congress across a, a wide array of questions about democratic attitudes. Um, and so the great Larry Bartels just published a book called Democracy Erodes from the Top. Well, it's kind of weird that we don't know much about the attitudes of the politicians Mm -hmm. who are responsible or not for making democracy erode. The fifth thing, again, with one of my great young colleagues, Luis Merini, we're doing a project, you'll hear 20 and a half minutes of it tomorrow, if you care to, about what generates and sustains democratic commitments in a place, Argentina, where democratic commitments before 1983 had been very notoriously weak. And the last thing um, is, it's a departure for me. Uh, it's a project on the US, a, a very well-known public intellectual named Lee Drutman, who, who works on political reforms in the US, asked if I would be interested in co-authoring something about um, proportional representation as one way of reducing um, gerrymandering and, and, and polarization in the US. So we will start working on that next month. Anyhow, here I am 40 years later, thrilled to be here, thrilled to, to be able to collaborate with so many great people. And I will say a bit more about that in round two. Okay, thanks, Scott. And, and thanks for hiring me too, by the way. <laughs> An email. Thank you. Um, so I, I was a kid in Argentina, I went to college, first generation in college, and somehow I got this crazy idea that I wanted to be an academic. And so I somebody told me, you know, if you, are, if you want to be an academic in political science, you should do a PhD in the US. And believe it or not, at that time, there was no internet. There was a, a time in history when there was no internet. <laughs> And and so I you will have you will send a letter and they would send you a, a, a brochure. And so I I knew I knew 
the Kellogg Institute because Guillermo Donner was here, right? Guillermo Donner was from Argentina. He was this big intellectual figure in Latin America. So I knew Kellogg. So I applied to Kellogg and I was like, well, this is never going to happen. And one day I'm, one day I'm at work and my mother calls and says, you know, Aníbal, this professor called one Scott Mainwaring or something. <laughs> and so I ended up here, which um, like, I, I'm, I'm sure many grad students will relate with, with my experience. Kellogg provided kind of intellectual environment, right? Not only the support to do my first field work, um, some, some, some of the work that was fundamental in my career, but, but the intellectual environment that allowed me to grow and develop my ideas. And I, I think we, we can all relate with that. Um, and as I look back, I, I finished my PhD there. I, I went here and I went to the University of Pittsburgh for 17 years as a faculty member. And as I think back, right, some of the main ideas that I that I learned and I developed here at Kellogg kind of followed me throughout my career. And, and if I had, I, I work on different themes, right? But uh, if I had to identify what is the core of all of them, I think that the core of all of them is my ingrained suspicion and concern about the power of the executive branch and how the executive branch, particularly in Latin America, is a potential threat to democracy in different contexts, right? So, so I studied how Congress can contain the executive branch to, through impeachment, how the executive branch captures um, the, the judiciary and so on and so forth, different themes. Um, finally had the opportunity to come back to Notre Dame in 2018. So, so it was coming back home. And here, I think in, in part because of the, the interdisciplinary environment of the Keogh School, I also started thinking about international law and the role of international law in relationship with the executive branch in different countries. And so I am increasingly now interested in, uh, as Scott was pointing out, thinking about the trajectories of democratic regimes. But I am also interested in thinking about how is it that we should think about the protection of democracy in those difficult times? And what is the role that international law, international organizations can play in that? Thanks, Anibal. Rachel. Thanks. Um, my name is um, Rachel Sweet, and I do cross-regional work on conflict and institutions in Africa and the Middle East, in particular in Democratic Republic of Congo and in Iraq. Um, Kellogg is an institute whose reputation precedes it. I arrived here, I suppose, as I was doing a postdoc and looking at job opportunities that were posted. And I came across this new school I hadn't heard of before, the Kioff School or Kio <laughs> School or something. Um, and I was thinking, you know, this looks interesting. It's at Notre Dame, um, but I'm not really sure. And a colleague turned to me and said, you know, that's where the Kellogg Institute is. Like they just created the school the Kellogg Institute is a part of. And I said, I'm applying to that. <laughs> um, so Kellogg is very much at the heart of why I'm here. And it's the heart of why I'm here, because for the questions that I ask about armed conflict and violence, these are not just theoretical questions that can be contained within an academic discipline. Violence is real, and it's in people's lives, and it's dirty, and it's tangible. And it was important for me to be at an institute, uh, to be at a school where I could engage the human normative stakes of the questions that we were asking. Um, and where the voices of the people and the communities on the ground in the places that I worked would also be taken seriously um, and would be given a point of accountability. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful for Kellogg and for the Keogh School as well um, for providing that place where I can talk to colleagues not only about the theoretical dimensions and the empirical dimensions of how I'm gathering data and doing my analysis, but also the actual stakes and the implications mm -hmm. behind it. Um, so that's what brought me here. Um, my work, so I am in my fourth year here, so I am um, brand new compared to a 40 year long um, career here. However, even within those few years, um, Kellogg has changed or has contributed to a change or a growth in my trajectory. When I came, I was um, only focusing at that point on questions of um, armed group organization and state institutions in Congo. And Kellogg has been a great help for me with that in terms of um, RAs um, who can help me code my 
40,000 pages of bureaucratic documents that rebels wrote um, and for my book project, um, but has also been a lot of the energy and support and enthusiasm behind the recent cross-regional move that I've made up into Iraq as well. Um, with the support of Kellogg, I was able to, I've been able to go to Iraq a few times now. Um, with the support of Kellogg, I've been able to start learning Arabic and developing um, on the ground collaborations with Iraqi researchers. Um, and through those collaborations, um, we've been able to do some cross-regional work in training local communities in questions of human rights documentation. So when a violent event breaks out in their community, um, how that event is described, if it is even captured at all in things like our main data sets or news reporting is oftentimes like misdescribed and that gap can be quite dramatic. Um, and has really large implications for impunity and identifying the wrong perpetrators. So Kellogg is helping to sponsor a, a cross-regional project between Iraq and Congo to provide human rights documentation training to the communities who witness violence themselves so that their voices can be the one to tell the story. Um, in addition, through those collaborations, uh, these new collaborations with researchers, um, in, in Iraq, I was able to spend time and get to know um, these people who are now my new colleagues and to ask them for the first time, if you were to do your own project about the place that you live in and are from, what would you want to do? Mm -hmm. um, because of like Kellogg's approach and flexibility. And so now I have my Iraqi collaborators come to me and say, hey, Rachel, I just got like a collection of like government militia contracts in the public sector. Can we do anything with this? Um, or, hey, Rachel, like I just recovered a trove of ISIS documents. Can we do anything with this? Um, and so this is this is feeding into a number of different projects on the nature of um, the evolution of violence, the evolution of state institutions and governance cross regionally. Um, it's giving us new insight into some state-backed militias within Iraq and how they're organizing within the public finance and sphere and bureaucracy. Um, and most recently, Kellogg has also contributed to a project on digital armies. So mm -hmm. looking at how um, militias also have an armed wing online. So trying to understand some of these digital disinformation campaigns that are meant to influence public opinion, meant to influence electoral politics in Iraq, um, and to take a look at some of the like back end supply chains of violence and how they organize in, um, on Telegram and on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, so Kellogg has really contributed to a, a, um, a growth and expansion um, in my um, in this direction already. Um, and it's providing some new theoretical insights into the gap between what is immediately visible about conflict and this like more invisible but realistic terrain of violence. Um, it's provided access to new information sources that I wouldn't have known existed um, a few years ago, like these militia contracts. Um, and it's also allowed for um, deepening community engagement. These projects are locally driven. They're um, through collaborators, not just at Kellogg, but also on the ground in communities um, in Congo and in Iraq, and are able to draw on some of the questions, observations, knowledge, and expertise of people who themselves um, didn't have opportunities for formal education. So we're doing this collaborative work cross-regionally um, in large part, um, thanks, to, thanks to Kellogg. Thanks, Rachel. Well, I think by these uh, very diverse research agendas, you can see how a variety of research interests come together to advance Kellogg themes. And I hope that Scott Appleby is right in saying the answer to the question of this panel, is Kellogg relevant going forward, is yes. But we want a little more detail on that. So I'm going to ask each of the, the panelists, how might we as Kellogg as a collective community of scholars, not just a group of individual scholars, but how might we work together to ensure that our research remains relevant for the next decade and beyond? And I'll let anybody who wants to address that one rather than going down the line. 
I'll jump in maybe quickly and say something brief. Jump in, make Pat. Three quick points. Okay. Um, there's all sorts of great answers to that question, I think, and I think you'll hear, we'll probably hear a number of them here. But my three points are these. Um, one point that has not been a, one of Kellogg's great attributes that has not been highlighted so far is its uh, its role as an educational institution here within the University of Notre Dame and the role it plays in educating, supporting undergraduates, master's students, and doctoral students. We've heard a bit about the doctoral students, uh, those who have been here as doctoral students and collaboration with doctoral work. That's probably the, the part of Kellogg's work as an educational unit um, that has the long, deepest history. Uh, but the undergraduate programs that are, are, have been here almost as long as the Institute, but that have really grown, deepened, and widened over the last 20 years, primarily under the leadership of Holly Rivers, um, th those are the, the range of those, the diversity of those, the quality of those is something that is, is ensures Kellogg's continued relevance at the University of Notre Dame and relevance in the lives of the students who participate in those. And that's, um, that's, that's no small thing. That's in some ways one of the deepest, I think most meaningful impacts that, that Kellogg has. Focus on research, focus on, but focus on engaging students with faculty, with projects, with thematic issues, um, pulling them outside of their departments, their majors or disciplines. Um, that's just a critical role. And then more recently to work with master's students in the in the Keogh School programs. So that's that that would be one of my first uh, sort of most passionate perhaps emphasis is Kellogg's role with students. Um, second, just very briefly, it's already been mentioned, but the continuing emphasis on themes rather than disciplines. As a, as, as a historian, I, so I've sometimes felt that Kellogg sort of flirts with that becoming just an, an adjunct of the political science department. <laughs> uh, but it has resisted falling completely into that. Uh, and, and, uh, and we have an engineer, a lawyer, uh, a historian up here at any rate. And, um, and, and, and focusing on the themes, on the interdisciplinarity, um, Doubling down, of course, on de democracy and development, but always being open. Scott Mainring, in, in, in the first decade I was here, was so good at this. Always being open to, to reaching out to other issues and other areas, other themes, other regions, um, and nurturing uh, so much of what's going on on campus is because Kellogg has nurtured it at early stages um, in interdisciplinary international spaces. And then the third relevance is um, Kellogg, uh, has a critical role to play in ensuring the success of the Keogh School. Um, Kellogg is older, bigger, stronger, deeper pockets uh, in the Keogh School. Um, and Kellogg is a key contributor to, to the, the, the life of this Keogh School um, and the success of the school. And that's a, a vital part over the next generation, I think, of how Kellogg will be relevant at the university, but more broadly in the world. Thanks, Ted. Tony's going to align. Yes. Okay, Sorry. that'll work. Um, so I, I guess I'd, I'd say take a slightly, I, oh, this all, I agree with everything that, that Ted said, but I'm going to emphasize a slightly different aspect of it. And that is that um, an institution is, is only relevant insofar as the, the, the people who compose it are working on things that are interesting and relevant and working together. And it's the character of the human beings in the community more than the particular topics, right? Um, and and that, that has been really the core of the Kellogg Institute from the start, is the, is the unique community of human beings that it assembles. Um, and that is the only uh, absolutely necessary condition for its continued relevance in the future, that it continues to bring together people who share their ideas, who are intensely interested in the reality that they're studying and in its relevance, who, who you know, fertilize this ground with their scholarship uh, and work together and are open to one another, that there's an ideal of intellectual friendship here that transcends ideology and is f fundamentally interested on an engagement with a, a human reality in all its forms. And that brings in you know, the, the, the critically important work that Kellogg has done in forming undergraduates, in forming graduate students, in recruiting visiting fellows and other visitors here uh, over the years, in, uh, in, in recruiting faculty members on a permanent basis here uh, as well. It is, first of all, a human community and a form of friendship, and otherwise it's not relevant in any way, no matter what else is being done. Um, and then the second thing I would say, and final thing, is that um, 
has, has been has been an undercurrent, I think, in a lot of the comments that we've heard already, is that uh, all of the research here, no matter, you know, I shouldn't say no matter, um, on top of being technically outstanding, uh, academically rigorous and innovative, it, it has a human dimension to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if Kellogg ever loses uh, that human dimension of what it's about, it will not be relevant. Okay. But again, like the, the existence of a form of friendship that is at its core, the, the existence and commitment to a fundamental sort of human, keeping that human dimension at the front and center of everything that we do, no matter what the disciplines are, no matter what the particular topics, no matter what the problems are as they evolve, it will, it will maintain rele relevance and it'll continue to be impactful as being a, a, a rich, integrated human community that is oriented towards fundamentally human problems. I think that was the perfect segue because the word human was repeated. Well, I don't know how many times in the closing there, but I think that is exactly where my mind was drifting when I when I got this question prompt and I was percolating on it. And I think that as we thought, talk about that bringing together um, of a community committed to doing this work together, I guess my call would be that in our next 40 years, we make sure that community continues to expand to bring those closest to the problems on the ground into that community to do the research with us. I think so often we do the work from afar and many of us strive to get as close as we can, but the solution lies with those closest to the problem. They have a unique voice and experience that when it shapes and defines our research, and I often say at day zero, engineers in particular are terrible about doing research and then shoving it on a community, right? Because we, we don't talk to humans well. Um, but bringing a community, imagine the world where a community is with you on day zero to frame the questions you're asking, the problems to be solved, the constraints around it, so that you are then pursuing a line of inquiry that's informed by the true essence of the problem to be solved, the challenge faced on the ground from a deep knowing of what that looks like. It would shape your agenda in a completely different way. It would ensure that agenda is relevant and that that work can translate and have impact. But it only happens when at day zero that work is framed that way. And if we could be so bold as to invite co-creation of our research with communities, I believe the research becomes even stronger. And academics aren't always good at that. The incentives aren't aligned to do that. But that is where true partnership to human-centered research you know, comes is when we bring our work to the field and we bring the field to us and we marry them together to do research in that way. It's so the second appeal. So that's a big part for me as an engineer. I've been preaching hard that we're making sure we're working on the right problems. And we sometimes think we know what problem needs to be solved and we have our next idea for our next project. And sometimes we need a good gut check that we're solving the right problems. Um, the second is an encouragement that I think the next generation of institutes like Kellogg and others, sharing was a word you brought up. And I wanna emphasize that point on sharing. There is so much rich, and this is where the engineer is gonna put her hat on, data that we're generating in the work we do our extent to which we properly share that data within the community so we can leverage one another's data to accelerate our learning, that we can share that data knowledge back with the communities that we have taken that data from often. We need to get into a culture where as much as we share our intellectual discourse and our passion for these problems and our community, we share the data. And as an engineer, when we open data, I think many of you have already learned that in your research, we revolutionize what we can discover together. But that only happens when we're all stewards of that data, we give it back and we truly even give it back to the communities. We bring those things back to the places where they come from. And we often aren't very good as academics in closing that cycle. We write our book, we write our paper and we close the chapter on that work and we need to be better stewards of that because that's actually a gift those communities give us and how we respect it and share it. It gives continued voice and, and honor to the stories they tell us and, and what's contained in that data. So that would be a second appeal. I know that we don't have a big data vault in, in Kellogg, do we? VDEM and other things are like that, but oh, let's imagine a world where we are all sharing our data transparently and openly with one another. And I think we could revolutionize the way we study these problems. Thanks, Tracy. Scott? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I the single word answer to the question is Kellogg still relevant is yes. <laughs> um, but let me think through that a little bit more deeply. So I, I completely agree with Ted that, you know, um, thank you for all this great work. Kellogg has become a major innovator and generator of great opportunities for undergraduates at Notre Dame. 
um, thanks to the great work of Denise Wright and others, right? It's also been a great generator of opportunities and community for our wonderful PhD students. In terms of scholarship, you know, what does it take for our scholarship to remain relevant, to um, maybe, you know, aspire to increase our relevance in the scholarly world? First, I, I think it has to be a very high quality. Um, if the scholarship isn't great, um, you know, what we, we are first and foremost a community of scholars, and we need to be at the forefront of scholarship in order to have a high impact. The second, you know, I think there, there are two dimensions I always encourage myself and my students to think about two different kinds of relevance. One is relevance in the world and the other is relevance in the scholarly world. And those two are not always easily combined. Um, my own discipline, political science, you know, has become more and more concerned with causal identification, with making sure you get the data very right on sometimes fairly narrow questions. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's fine. It can be important, but we also need to continue asking what has been Kellogg's trademark since ground zero. And that is, what are the big questions in the world? And how do we contribute scholarship toward answering those questions? And that's still true of, of what we are doing here today. Um, but we can't lose sight of that. Just one little coda. And here I think, you know, the EO school is a great new addition. Um, we also have to make an effort to bring our scholarship to the world, right? It's not, it, the world doesn't come to us and say, oh, you know, what is, what is, what have these folks written, right? In recent years, it, it doesn't, it sometimes works that way, but it usually doesn't. And so our purposeful efforts to engage broader audiences I, th I think we just have to continue nurturing those efforts. It's not easy because we are so, we have so many demands on our time, um, but it's the right thing to do. And we can learn a lot of things that you don't learn in an ivory tower. Let me uh, just build on what Scott was saying. I, I think that not only Kellogg is relevant at 40, my sense is that is today is more relevant than ever in, at, at some level, right? Because if you look at the founding generation of Kellogg, right? The generation that set the intellectual trajectory of Kellogg early on. And Scott is here. I can see Samuel Valenzuela in our audience, right? This this was a generation that articulated a, in the, an intellectual project in which there is a, the principle of high quality research, as Scott was pointing out, but also the idea that the institute and the, the community of the institute had, has to address the, the great problems of the day, right? 40 years ago, some of the great problems of the day were, some of them were very similar to the ones we have today, right? How do we create development? How do we reduce inequality? But some of the problems were how do we move from dictatorships into democracy? And and today some of the some of the problems remain the same, and some of the problems have, have changed. Right today we worry very much about how do we prevent democracies from going backsliding into dictatorship. Um, but still, the the mission of thinking very seriously and very rigorously about the great problems of the day is is what we do. Is a, is our mission. I think this is closely related to the Catholic mission of the university, the idea that we must do research that matters, that we must do research that benefits and is in connection with the communities we work on with, as, as uh, Tracy was pointing out. And I would just say that to, to keep this moving forward, um, I want to emphasize two things that have been already mentioned, right? The first one is the issue of community. Whenever you ask people about Kellogg, the first thing that comes up into the conversation is, oh, you have a great community. And that seems to be a defining element of how people from different different disciplines, different trajectories, different perspectives really integrate very well into, into an intellectual community. 
Um, and the other thing that I think Scott mentioned is, I think we need to be very proactive in reaching out to the world um, to explain what we are doing and to share our results with what what we are doing to make a to make a contribution to the to the largest uh, world. And I think in that sense, um, being part of the of the Kyoto School of Global Affairs is a great opportunity for the Institute. Um, thank you. I think that um, we would be remiss on a question about looking forward to the future of Kellogg um, without um, also acknowledging some of the youngest members of this community who are our undergrads. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with several um, Kellogg ISP students, at least one of whom is here um, today, and I have really been deeply impressed um, with the way that um, these students come to the table asking big questions, relevant questions, um, asking questions to do with, with conflict in institutions and global health and development, um, and also have really a hunger of wanting to know what is the most relevant way of approaching this program um, so that we can be participating in these questions with the communities that are asking them around the world. Um, so I would just um, want to acknowledge um, our youngest members of the community also here. I think that they're really integral um, and are integral also in carrying that torch forward into the future as well and bringing the vision of Kellogg to wherever they'll go, whether it's study abroad, um, other PhD programs or career paths. One of the um, exciting um, aspects of Kellogg since I've been here is um, is Kellogg's um, commitment to thinking more globally, um, to incorporating um, more work on the ground in Africa, to supporting my work in Iraq as well. Um, and this um, regional flexibility and the ability to look at, quest at thematic issues through a cross-regional comparative perspective, um, I think is something that is really helpful to propel Kellogg into its next steps into the future. Um, at the same time, um, um, Tracy, building on your like questions around how do we listen deeply to invite and to co-create research with communities around the world, I think there's also some invitations around what that collaboration and partnership process might look like. And in particular, I wonder about the role that Kellogg can play as an institutional lever to fill a gap between um, the questions that communities are asking and these academic spaces um, and the policy spaces and practitioner spaces. And so I wonder about um, possibilities for, um, for bridging some of Kellogg's work in areas where the nature of questions may not fit comfortably within a predefined literature mm. and discipline, or where some of the methodological approaches may may be uh, may be different. So um, I'm I'm excited to think about um, building up these cross regional partnerships and collaborations, um, and also thinking about what new innovative methodologies we mm -hmm. can bring to the table um, through this. Um, on the ground work, um, certainly not only to retain rigor, but to advance rigor methodologically, um, and also um, to make sure and to ad adapt the, the ways that we're asking questions so that um, different perspectives, different um, ontological commitments might also be um, present within that space as well. Mm -hmm. Follow up, Paul. Thanks, Sharon. A quick follow up there. I was thinking as I was listening to um, all the other wonderful interventions, but was provoked in particular, Scott, by your reference to big questions uh, and being a place where big questions get asked and try to be addressed and big explanations. And, and it's, it struck me that one thing that hasn't been mentioned at all uh, by any of us yet, but it seems to me absolutely central to the ongoing relevance and, and importance of uh, the Kellogg Institute as a part of the university, as well as sort of in a larger space of the world, is um, to, to really take seriously and embrace the Catholic mission of the university and the Kellogg Institute's relationship to it. Um, I don't think the university can fulfill its Catholic mission without the Kellogg Institute. 
uh, global perspective and the kinds of big questions that, that can be asked here and should be asked. And, 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 I, and I think that our, uh, our continued uh, um, embrace of that larger perspective that the university's Catholic mission gives to us is, is vital to um, the, the big normative questions that we're all trying to pose, that every one of us has raised in one form or another, um, on a global scale, that, you know, that, that they're really a, a concern for the wounds of the world is what the Kellogg Institute needs to be about. And the Catholic mission will help us maintain that. And, and secondly, it'll help us maintain the kind of community we want to be if we take it seriously. And, and third and lastly, uh, you know, the, the one thing that a, a Catholic university is, if nothing else, I think, is in, in its ideals, uh, is about the unity of all forms of knowledge. Um, the, and and that, you know, the, the reality is one. It's not, it's not uh, in different disciplines. Um, and, and so that embracing, I think, also helps us to sort of push us to say, but all these different fragments of reality that we're all studying and different methods and different kinds of data and different parts of the world. But at the end of the day, it's all one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we need to remember that in order to be able to ask and, and hope to answer some of those really big questions. Thanks, Paolo. Anyone else have follow-up thoughts? All right. Well, I do want to make sure that I leave time for questions from the audience, but I do have one more question that I would like to ask the panel. And um, that is what excites you most about the work of the Institute going forward? Scott, you want to start? You're not. Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. <laughs> what excites me about the work of the Institute going forward is what has excited me and energized me for 40 years. Great colleagues, great collaborators, great students, great staff. It's really, I mean, I, I feel this very deeply. It's an exceptional scholarly and human community. I want to take just a minute here to, to mention some of the people that have been amazing parts of that community for me faculty colleagues, but um, those of you, who I, I've probably, I'm sure I've co-authored with at least 15 of our graduate students. And, um, you know, that too has been a, just an amazingly important and enriching part of my experiences as a, you know, I've said this to, to students that, um, to, to graduate students that they've not only been an important part of my career, they've been a really important part of my life. Um, you know, when I go to Buenos Aires, the people that I hang out with are former students. Um, so anyhow, um, you know, I, I arrived here very young. I actually, it was so many years ago that I actually had hair, believe it or not. <laughs> that, that was part of me at, at some point in life. Um, but one constant has been that I've had great colleagues this whole time. Samuel Valenzuela was one of the earliest, Guillermo Donnell, um, and we interacted very, very intensely in those early years. We, it was a very small institute that, at that time. We interacted more intensely then than now, but that was the nature of the beast. Um, and then uh, Tim Scully was one of the next arrivals, one of my great friends in life. We did three books together. The great Robert Fishman, who was here for a long time. Uh, Michael Coppage. Uh, Michael arrived almost 30 years ago. And um, he's been, you know, I, I think if, if, if you were without question in my mind, Michael was the generator of the most important project that we've produced at, at the Kellogg Institute, the Varieties of Democracy Project, and that will be the most enduring as well. Um, Fran Hagopian, with whom I interacted closely here in the three years that I was on vacation in <laughs> Massachusetts, <laughs> but also hey. some visiting fellows. Um, many of you knew Ana Maria Bejarano and Eduardo Pizarro. Ana Maria, both of them were important friends and collaborators. Um, Guillermo Trejo, who's just done, you know, he's funny as all to get out, but smarter than he is funny or vice versa, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Another great colleague. And then 
what happens when I'm on vacation in Massachusetts? An evil comes. <laughs> and that made it inevitable that I would return. And, and uh, more recently, Abby Cordoba. So, I mean, who, who in their career gets blessed with this kind of, of colleagues? And our great undergraduates and graduate students too. So kudos to all of you. Thanks, Scott. I'm happy to go next. I sure, um, but um, but in part because I, I can go in a completely different direction. Um, I uh, what excites me most is um, newness. I would oh. say if I had to put it in one word, right? I, you know, over three decades into an academic career, it, it it's really easy to like just be thinking about the same ideas and working on the same things and publishing the same kinds of stuff and. I, there's, you know, uh, what we all don't we all desire for life to be new, right? All the time for interesting things, new people, new ideas, things that actually you know, make us feel like in the morning we want to get up and 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 we're happy and excited about what's in front of us and the problems, in, in, you know, that are difficult and precisely in their difficulty they're engaging. The Kellogg Institute does that for me because the people are always new, and they're always bringing new ideas, relevant ones. And at the same time, though, it's not novelty for novelty's sake. It's like, oh, let's be new in order to be like trendy, right? Is let's 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 always try to be new and to renew our community, renew our ideas, because that's the way that we are actually the the most fulfilling what we're meant to be as as an institute. And that makes my life new. That, that, and that's what I love. So you know, I mean, this year it's. It's on sort of social media and political polarization, but two years from now, it might be something completely different. And if it is, that'll be in large part because of the newness of people and idea that I'm encountering here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used to always say at, at more than 20 years at the Kellogg Institute, it was never boring. It was always new. And um, the visiting fellows especially were something that brought that newness to our community every year. Anyway. Tracy, you were. Yeah. No, I mean, I think Go the ahead. spirit of newness for me, what excites me, it is where we're going next as a university and knowing that Kellogg, the Kew School is going to be such an important pillar in where we go next. You know, Notre Dame reached out to the world uh, in the past strategic plan. Now the world's coming to Notre Dame. Like I really do feel this sense that all the good work that it's gone on for 40 years created a foundation upon which this university sees it could scaffold its next vision. And that's pretty amazing. And there's very few communities on this campus could look in the mirror and say, wow, like we're on the precipice of that next step in the vision of this great university and great Catholic university. And having us not be apologetic about our mission and who we are as a university and seeing its most valuable treasures now and saying, let's build a vision around those and set the next 10 years on that course. That for me is exceptionally exciting. And I know that, you know, the roadshow is starting to go out with the strategic plan and the provost will make his rounds to various units on campus, but I was genuinely excited by what I heard and the pillars I can see them building the vision for the next 10 years of this university. And I think we're on the cusp of greatness and it's a great testament to what's been built in the community at the heart of it. The people that are here and have been through four decades of this place have been the reason with all the rigor, yet the heart combined have really made it something that the university now sees it can bet on. And I think that's an exceptional testament to everything that's been built here. Thank you. Ed, Anibal. I, I just want to say that if you if you go outside after this this session and you will you will see this wonderful timeline that mm -hmm. some of our colleagues invested a lot of time and and his historical effort in building, recovering the, the history of the Institute. It's a fantastic timeline. And when you look at that, you realize the intellectual legacy that the Kelo Institute has produced, right? The faculty, the students, the visiting fellows. And for me, what is exciting about the, the Institute is just the end of the timeline, right? What comes next in a moment in which clearly, as I said before, it seems that our contribution is, is more important than ever. And as Tracy pointed out, it's our opportunity to continue playing a role, a fundamental role in not only in addressing these fundamental problems of our times, but also in contributing to make Notre Dame a major research university that is a Catholic university. Mm -hmm. Rachel. 
Um, I, I would just say that as I'm um, listening to all of your reflections, I also just enjoy learning a lot about Kellogg. Uh, Kellogg is a great uh, place to be um, a new faculty member and in an early stage in a career. Um, and what, what excites me most is um, hearing about the, the foundational commitment to both the rigor and the big questions and the human stakes, all of those three things together. Um, and the growth into the future. Um, excited about the cross-regional growth, the thematic growth, um, and the growing communities here as well. So, mm -hmm. Ed, just briefly, Scott and Scott and Paolo can 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 uh, empathize with this, or have, I think probably have felt this in various forms. It's the it it connects with newness. It connects with the rebirth that that, that Tracy talked about earlier. And and I'll wrap around quickly to a point Rachel made earlier, but that's coming off of eight years or so of fairly um, intense administrative work, feeling like um, there's, a, there's, there's new life ahead. And that, <laughs> there, there's, that, that new life is in this terrific community that you've heard so much about. Um, the, I think that, you know, if I, what a, there's a, quite a number of things that like Paolo said, the newness, the looking ahead at, at, at the potential, is tremendously exciting, um, and I'm excited about much of it. But one thing I would just really highlight it that a number of people have mentioned, Rachel perhaps per most particularly, is working with undergraduates, teaching, thinking about classes, thinking about um, about redesigning courses for undergraduates in a way that gets me to think about ideas in new ways, and that takes advantage of the 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 the, the intellectual life that this this place really. Um, inculcates in, in faculty and in graduate students and in undergraduates. And that's an exciting prospect. All right. Thanks, everyone. I did want to leave time for questions at the end, and we have just a little more than 10 minutes left. So if anyone in the audience would like to ask questions of our panelists, Clemens. We need a microphone to make. Thanks, Denise. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Also from your younger brother and sister institute, you know, 10 years younger. Um, <laughs> and I, I would like to ask you, there's all these wonderful things happening and this excitement and the wonderful things about the future. Um, we are now part of, of a family where you have adopted siblings. And, and uh, we might want to think about how we can work together, you know, with the sister institutes uh, in the Q school and beyond and think about the Kellogg as part of a landscape where you have other, you know, partners who would be excited to work with, with Kellogg and the wonderful colleagues and the topics and any insights on that would be greatly appreciated. Happy birthday. Great question, Clemens. Thanks. <laughs> I mean, I'll give three three quick thoughts uh, to it, uh, Clemens, to that really, really important question. Um, I'd say that um, uh, one goes back to the question of people. Uh, we, you know, the institutes share a great, great many of our fellows, uh, and and scholars work across them, and uh, and and they tangibly represent the the collaboration of the institutes. Um, and the second thought is that, um, you know, although we we have tended just for historical reasons to define the institute's respective identities and uh, scope and mandates in thematic or subject matter terms, they also have different characters institutionally as a kind of institution, the kinds of things that they focus on, right? Um, a particular policy orientation or a particular emphasis on undergraduate research or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and that to think of those as as complementary identities that that are independent of the fact that Nanovic does Europe and you know and and Kellogg focuses more on Latin America and Africa or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll just stop there. Those are a couple of initial thoughts. Mm -hmm. Tracy, yeah, I, I mean, something? I do think that that is the greatest challenge and opportunity I see not only in the Keogh School but this campus. When you actually do a landscape analysis and see all the great work that's unfolding. And then beg the question that how could we better leverage and focus that together? What impact could we have if we could do so? 
I share the exact same feeling you do that the more we build the bridges, the better we are. And it's almost a call to me even think beyond the sister institutes, you know, how can we leverage? Because it is quite remarkable at this place, how much organically grows across this university because we have this common, you know, this place, I think the mission of the school draws a certain type of people to Notre Dame. And as a result, all across this campus, there are potentials that we could thread together. It's tricky to do. But I think if we can particularly now start focusing this more under the new strategic plan of the Keogh School and in this new framework of the university, I think the multiplier effect is going to be tremendous. So Clemens, I'm all on board with that. And I want to see more of that across campus because I believe the as sooner the sooner we drop the silos, the sooner we're all going to have an impact. And I want to see so much more of that in a great Catholic university. Mm -hmm. Anibal? Um, I, I, thanks, Clemens, for the question. I think we are we are in a way um, it's we are mandated to collaborate because of our our constitution. So universe, universities are always beautifully messy, right? Because you have all of these institutions that within universities that overlap, that, that sometimes duplicate what they are doing from different perspectives for a multiplicity of reasons, right? But I think in, in the this is true in every university in Notre Dame, is is true in, in an interesting way in the Keogh School, right? Which creates a very interesting dynamic. But I think when you think about the history of our institutes, right? They were created with with natural overlaps at some level, but also with a common mission that, mm -hmm. that facilitates our our collaboration. So we are celebrating the 40, 40th anniversary of the Kellogg Institute today, but we are also celebrating, we should not forget this, right? The, the 50th anniversary of the Clow Institute mm -hmm. for Civil and Human Rights. And if you think about how Father Hesburgh conceived, right, the creation of the Clow Institute in 1973, and then the Kellogg Institute in 1980-82, right, there is this process, and then the, the Kroc Institute, right, one dealt with human rights and civil rights, one dealt with, with democracy and development, another one dealt with peace, but all of them at some level have this common mission of, of defending human dignity, and I think that's the space in which we can collaborate. Mm -hmm. Samuel. I'd like to emphasize the fact that well, my work and the work of all of my, my colleagues, I know, stems profoundly from my and their values. That's, I think, extremely important for me when I write about the failures of welfare institutions, I want to make sure that that has an, has an impact. When I write about um, the ways certain countries have solved conflicts in the past, I want to make sure that that produces lessons for the future. But I want to make sure that all of this is written in such a way that you don't really see the values that are behind it. That everything is written with the highest quality of scholarship. And that is the essential key to having a great institute. It's the quality of the scholarship. And I know I'm repeating something that has been said before, but there are some things that are worth repeating. <laughs> All right. And I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Bright. I recognized you, but I couldn't remember your name. And I should have remembered it because you are bright. <laughs> bright. Thank you so much for the panel. I really know a lot. So my question, I'm interested in what are some of the challenges that Kellogg has faced over its course of 40 years and how has the Institute overcome those challenges? Thank you. He's on Thank this you. one. Go. <laughs> Go ahead, Scott. Well, I think it's a really interesting question. I mean, one challenge is how you build on strengths, but do new things, right? Um, because you want to do both. Um, if you don't do new things, as endowments grow, there's something really wrong with your great creativity and with your resource utilization. Um, so that that is central, uh, you know. Then there are leadership succession issues, um, like 
in every, every institute, right, you need good leadership if you're going to meet new challenges. Um, I think um, the how we integrated into the Keough School, right? I mean, that was a big opportunity, but also a non-trivial challenge. We were used to going off and just, you know, figuring out our own priorities. And now under Paolo's leadership, there was the challenge of figuring out how to fold Kellogg into a big new important campus initiative. I mean, those are those are some of the things, you know, there, there are of course many other challenges, but those are just three to to begin the conversation. Small ones. <laughs> Paolo, you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, I was going to highlight the Keogh School, but Scott already did that. Um, the one thing that I would add, perhaps, is um, a perennial challenge, something that I think will be recurrent throughout, or I hope will be recurrent throughout the life of the Kellogg Institute for many more decades, because it's a sign actually of health, is the challenge of the tension between depth and breadth of the work. Um, and, and you've seen that throughout the entire 40-year history of the Kellogg Institute, you know, expanding in various ways, contracting, but going in order to go deeper in particular issues and other times and ways. And, and that's good. It's a, I think that's, a, a, as I said, I think that's a healthy dynamic um, that, that ensures a certain kind of growth and a certain kind of self-critical reflection about where we are at any given point. But, it, but it's often not easy to manage. Um, because people have different interests and different priorities and different passions and and some of them you know want to go down and some of them going to go out and uh, and so it's it's something that always has to be attended to I think mm -hmm. that's I mean that's a very good point right sometimes if you want to have impact you might have to be more strategic in what you invest in and how you build critical mass and that inevitably causes you to prune back and those are all, always painful moments I think that's the burden a lot of leaders face is trying to figure out the judicious way to direct those resources to have the maximum impact while still maintaining a community where everyone can find a home and value. And that's tough in, a, in something like Kellogg, as big as it is and also as diverse as it is. And I think that's a dual challenge. Mm -hmm. But also, if I may add, because in, in any university, some of the, the great innovation, the great ideas come from the faculty and the students, mm -hmm. right? So all the time we need to be open to these new new ideas that are coming up and they sometimes redefine priorities for an institute because it's a, it's it's fantastic ideas that, yep. that move the, yep. our scholarship yep. forward. Well, we are just about out of time, but we might have time for one more question if there's anyone out there. Did I miss someone? Oh. Could I ask how you measure your uh, success? How do you measure your return on investment? That's a quick question. Well, that, sounds, that sounds like an advisory board question. <laughs> <laughs> well, Aniba, that, 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 that question is only for you. I'm yeah, I, I, I think that one's yours, Aniba. So uh, we're done measuring our success. <laughs> 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 well, I, if if I can say, I would like to hear your your answer. So anyway, but but um, I think the the main fundamental measure of our success is this, right? It's the the community we have here, right? The the, the commitment, the loyalty, the spirit of our faculty, our students, our board members, our visiting fellows, former visiting fellows who came here. Um, that's a, that's the the main metric that I think we should keep in mind. And the, and the second metric is the impact that the ideas generated by this institute have had mm -hmm. over 40 years in academic communities across the world, and then um, in, in actual life in the rest of the world, right? So people in, in, in the Kellogg Institute um, early on engaged in what they call not, not wishful thinking, but thoughtful wishing. Mm -hmm. And they started, they dared to think about the possibility of dictatorships transited into democracy when nobody, they're thinking about that, right? Uh, in the 1980s. And then throughout the 1980s, we saw transitions to democracy in Latin America. And in the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we saw transitions to democracy in Eastern Europe. So how our ideas in a way help many other people to interpret the world, but also shape it is I think our main metric of success. All right. Well, we are out of time. 
So thank you all for coming. Thank you all to the panelists. And I look forward to a lot of interaction over the next two days.